Are you ready for an open discussion with the best of the best and the best of what's next? Welcome to the Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Join in on a great conversation today with one of the world's great influencers as they showcase the latest tricks and techniques that made them the game changers they are today. Now, here's Tony D'Urso. Welcome, I'm your host, Tony D'Urso. Today's show is with visionaries Mark Byron and Laura Jennings. Mark is a successful British Nigerian investment banker who takes us on a journey through this phenomenal economic giant, Africa Arrives, the title of his new book, which is already shaking the business world and creating amazing opportunities and wealth just for the taking. Laura is the CEO of modern gifting company NAC. Prior to NAC, Laura was a venture capitalist with the international private equity firm Atlas Ventures. She began her career at Microsoft, where she ran a number of core businesses, including the email division and MSN. More on them in a moment, but first, with two high-profile and high-volume talk shows, I'm doing what you would expect. That's right, I'm combining them into one show. Can you pardon my dust while I expand? The new show is what you're hearing now, The Tony D'Urso Show. I will continue to broadcast every Friday at 1 p.m. on Voice America's Influencers Channel. Please set your calendar to hear from the world's elite. This show continues to be published every Friday on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, on the mobile app, and everywhere you're listening to my shows now. Now on one show, you'll hear from world-class influencers, celebrities, and elite entrepreneurs. I sincerely appreciate you as a great engaging audience, and I do hope you understand this consolidation as I am expanding tremendously. The summary, continue to listen to my shows just as you normally do, the way you normally do. That was easy. And thanks again for being a great audience. I love your feedback and welcome your comments as always. Today's interview is with visionaries Mark Byron and Laura Jennings. All right, here's some info on Mark. Mark is a successful British Nigerian investment banker who takes us on a journey through this phenomenal economic giant. From the financial corridors of Cairo to the petroleum politics of Lagos, from the real estate construction boom in Cape Town and to the high-tech revolutions in Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, and Accra, Mark discusses the book that's turning the heads of entrepreneurs worldwide, Africa Arrives. It's so great to have you on my show, Mark. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Tony. Mark, my pleasure. You know, you don't hear much about Africa these days from the entrepreneur side. I've interviewed people from all over the world, talking about many countries. But this is the first time that we're going to talk about what is considerably the world's hottest market, Africa. I can't wait to find out more about this. But right before we do that, Mark, I'd like to know a little bit about you How did it all start for you? What's your backstory? That's a very good question, Tony. So I was born in London, was to uh, my late father, who was a diplomat of the Nigerian High Commission. And at the age of five, went back, we went back to Nigeria, uh, had all my sort of um, understudies, no, high school, until the age of 20 when I came back to the UK and then did my undergrad. I think for me, it was a story of sort of uh, the unknown, because at the tender age of five, I I never knew anything about the UK until I came back at the ripe age of 20. And um, yeah, to say, you know, things started to unravel for me. So did my undergrad school and then came to the US to do my MBA. And I think the sort of epiphany for me was at the business school, because I had a lecture And fortunately for us, it was actually given by one of the top hedge funders in the U.S. And at that point in time, I think we were going through the subprime debacle because it was 2008. And this particular hedge fund guy was actually saying to us that Africa would be the next big story. And I mean, that was when the penny dropped for me in terms of, okay, I sort of gone, you know, round circles left Nigeria, came to the UK, went to the US, and now listening to this headphone guy saying Africa is about to just be blown out of the water. And I think that was actually what made it for me to go back to Africa to start my journey of um, entrepreneurship. I find this quite fascinating. As you know, my wife is from Kenya 
in Africa. And as a result, I know stories and more layers of Africa, how, it, how things are going out there, what's going on out there, probably more than people hear about in the media, social media, or what have you. It's quite something. And now it appears that for the savvy entrepreneur, let me just read the tagline of the, of the book here, the byline of the book, Africa Arrives. It says, the savvy entrepreneur's guide to the world's hottest market. And I think that's so interesting because we, in our minds, we think of poverty, we think of people on the streets, people perhaps begging for money. We think of, you know, perhaps some of the crime. And yeah, I think I think you you hit the nail on the head because if we if we go back almost over 30, 30 odd years ago, I'm sure you remember the U.S. aid for Africa, where you had all the celebrity musicians come together trying to sort of uh, raise this awareness of helping Africa out of poverty. And I think there's always been a, this sort of misconception that Africa is always uh, what you can call a, a poster child for poverty. I think I sort of fell into that sort of club or bucket when I was here you know, in living in the UK because obviously the media always portraying that, oh, Africa is this, Africa is that. It wasn't until I went back and then pretty much started to sort of uh, do my own sort of thing in terms of my business. And I got to know that, look, there's actually more to Africa in terms of positivity unknown to a lot of people out there in the world. And for me, it was, it was a time to say, look, I have to sit down and pen this into a book so that I can make all there will be people who want to sort of invest in Africa see the other side, see the lighter side of Africa. I think that, was, that for me was actually the rationale behind writing this book. That is actually quite an eye-opener there, exactly as you say. So tell us, what is it that makes your book, Africa Arrives, different from other books and what makes it unique? Very good question. So I think you've got a whole lot of books out there, and I think we've already talked about, well, if you want to call it the dark side or whatever they call, what they call the dark continent. So you have one camp who tries to paint this negative picture about Africa being a basket case. And then you have another camp who's trying to paint a rosy picture. Oh yeah, Africa is the final frontier. You got to get in there, do whatever you can, and then get out. Now, for us, as far as when I say us, myself and my co-author, what makes this book quite unique for us is basically... We've actually taken Africa and then gone through like a forensic marketing in terms of each of the countries. So when I say each of the countries, I'm talking about the countries that I've actually visited. So you've got 54 countries in Africa, out of which I've actually visited 20. And when I say visit, it's not from a sort of touristic perspective, but in terms of doing business. So that sort of experience for me actually play the key role in terms of penning this book together. So in a nutshell, we've actually taken a sort of a forensic approach in terms of writing this book, breaking each country down by its industry, population, you know, politics, and the technology potential so that whoever is trying to get into the continent, whichever country they want to go to, we can now say, here's the sector that is hot. Here's how you have to go about navigating the sector, making sure that, you know, you don't actually fall into that sort of what you call the risky bracket. Of, I mean, because you do hear bad stories as well of people who've gone in, who've lost their shirt. So I think for us, it's more like a, you want to call it a business guide for would-be investors trying to navigate the continent. You know, most people, when you say Africa... I don't think there are very many people that think that there are 54 countries. That's a lot when you think about it. And that's a lot of opportunity when you think about it, even for another second. We'd love to get some great tips, and I'm going to ask for some later. So make sure that you give us, for the entrepreneurs in the audience, which is a good portion, we would love to know what would be some of the best areas to get into. But before we do that, I want to take apart a couple of other things. One thing that caught my eye is in your book, you talk about two Africas, you talk about four Africas. Now, wait a second, please. 
We know there's Africa and we know there's South Africa. Perhaps you could clarify this whole thing for us. Okay, good question. So basically what we've actually done also is um, I've taken Africa and said, okay, we well, got 54 countries, but then out of the 54 countries, which are the hottest markets? So let's start with the four Africas. So right now, I mean, the four Africas, what, what, I, what I have as the four hot markets right now, we've got Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, and Ethiopia. And just you know, out of coincidence, only a week or two ago, we had two Western leaders, that's the Prime Minister of the UK and the German Chancellor, pay a visit to you know, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya. So basically, the four Africas is like, okay, these, for us, are the hardest markets for any would-be investor looking to navigate Africa. Now, in terms of the two Africas, what we've done is the North African part of Africa, we've actually taken Morocco and we've taken Egypt as the two trailblazers in that continent. Now, of late, Morocco actually launched I could say commission the largest solar farm, get this, the largest solar farm in the world, not, not even in Africa, in the world. So Morocco for us also is one of the two trailblazers. Egypt, yes, you could argue that we had the uprising back in 2011, the Arab Spring, but it's also made a massive turnaround whereby you now have a lot of tourists when I say tourists, even business savvy tourists go into Egypt to do business. So basically that in a nutshell is what I've used as my sort of um, connotation for two Africas and four Africas. Thanks. That makes good sense. Okay. So far, so good. And now another thing that you mentioned in your book that caught my attention is I think these are separate as well. The anchor nations of the sub Sahara which I believe you mean everything south of the Sahara. And if so, what are these anchor nations and why are they so important and different from our four big ones we just mentioned? Okay, so the four anchor nations, I mean, if you, if you look at, we've actually used the sort of Wall Street paradigm. Um, if I go back to your earlier question about what makes the book unique. So we've taken the sort of Wall Street approach in terms of ratings whereby you have like the buy, the strong buy, hold, buy, hold or sell. So now in terms of the four anchor nations, what we're doing is, okay, we've talked about the four Africas. Which of the other countries are the next in line to be, will be four? That's what we talk about, the anchor nations. So for example, we've mentioned countries like Namibia, Cote d'Ivoire, Mozambique, Botswana and Rwanda. Now, out of all those lots, because I had the opportunity to go to Rwanda, I must tell you that Rwanda is actually a success story. I think a lot of people will remember Rwanda for the genocide. But I think for me to say there's been a turnaround and a success in Rwanda is just an understatement. This is the Tony D'Urso Show. Just ahead, the chat continues with visionaries Mark Byron and Laura Jennings. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. This is the Voice America Influencers Channel. Be inspired. Check out my other great interviews at TonyDURSO.com or Using your Android or iPhone, get the app at TonyDURSO.com slash mobile. That's TonyDURSO.com or slash mobile. Hi, if you're like me, the list of books you want to read or those people suggest you read is never ending and it's always expanding. I get so many books from amazing people who want to be on my shows that it's just not possible to read them all. Our sponsor, Blinkist, has solved our long list of must-reads once and for all. Blinkist is the only app 
that takes thousands of the best-selling nonfiction books and distills them down to their most impactful elements so you can read or listen to them in under 15 minutes all on your phone. With Blinkist, you'll expand your knowledge and learn more in just 15 minutes than you can in almost any other way. Plus, you can listen anywhere. I like to listen to Blinkist while I'm driving. Some people like to spend their first 15 minutes of the day listening to something inspirational to get them started for work. How about you? The Blinkist library is massive from timeless classics like the 7 Habits of Highly Effective People to the 80-20 Principle. My personal recommendation is to check out the 4-Hour Workweek again. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash revenue to start your free 7-day trial. How cool is that? That's Blinkist spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash revenue to start your free 7-day trial. And you can cancel it any time. Blinkist.com slash revenue. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Now you don't have to stay linked to your desktop or laptop. Take Voice America on the go and listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. We don't follow. We lead. Join us. The Voice America Influencers Channel. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back on The Tony D'Urso Show. Today's show is with visionaries Mark Byron and Laura Jennings. Mark Byron's co-author is Robert Joseph Ahola. He's a Malibu author playwright who's written and produced 16 plays, including Judas Agonistas, Narcissus, and Pavlos Cats. He's authored or co-authored 16 books, including The Return of the Hummingbird Wizard, I, Dragon, and The Silent Healer, and also screenplays for six films, including Whitman and Champagne, the series. And he's a winner of three Cleos. All right, and now back to the chat with Mark. So these are the kind of incarnations. These are sort of will be the next, if you want to call it, the next big four Africas. That's why we've used the word anchor. Because remember I mentioned Africa is made up of 54 countries. Now, if we take four, which is pretty much you know, the trailblazers, you've got two in North Africa, that makes six. So we're left with 48. So what we're actually doing is breaking each down and saying, who are the next trailblazers? Who are the next big stories in Africa? That basically is how we sort of described the Anchor Nations. Okay, and something about them economically, politically, civilly, something you see this promise. You've been there. So with your eyes, tell us what you see that makes you say these are promising nations on the rise and that entrepreneurs should really take a look at doing business in these not underdeveloped, but developing nation or developing countries, excuse me, that really have a lot more potential? Okay, good question. So, I mean, we use in the economic world, we actually no longer say developing, but we say frontier. So if I have to put on my economic hat, we say frontier. So I will use the example of Rwanda. As I said, again, that's a great success story for me. I happened to meet with one of the key 
innovators in um, Rwanda. I mean, currently, they actually set aside, I think it's about 20 hectares of land that's going to be developed as the Kigali Innovation Center. Now, that's due to launch Q1 of next year. And basically, what the goal or the ambition is, they want to target all the will-be smart graduates in Africa to come to that innovation center. So if you, can, if you can think of Silicon Valley, right? Let's just take a step back. If you think of Silicon Valley and what the success story has been in Silicon Valley, that's basically what has been replicated at this innovation city. And the good thing is they've actually signed a memorandum of understanding with Carnegie Mellon. So Carnegie Mellon will have sort of visiting lecturers who will be assistant in terms of research and development they're going to have the likes of IBM, Google, Microsoft on the site. So when you have students coming up with you know, innovative ideas, they could actually put that into sort of a prototype phase and stage immediately with any of those companies that I've mentioned. So I think for me, I mean, Rwanda is actually one of the runaway success stories when it comes to uh, anchor nations. I'm finding this very exciting, Mark, because also as an entrepreneur, my mind is going and I see some amazing opportunities. I'm actually extremely excited. I'm always excited, but now I'm even more excited because I see so much. I mean, you've just opened my eyes of this incredible potential. I believe Africa, well, aside from Asia, it's the biggest continent in the world. It's huge. And all these countries, such opportunity, it just blows my mind. I love it. And so I appreciate that you've opened up my eyes and I sure hope you've opened up a lot of other eyes so that we can go out there and help and build. Now, another aspect to this, and I've noticed in your book, first of all, there's this word, I want to make sure I pronounce it. Very cool word. Afrenennials. Did I say that right? Afrenennials. <laughs> Afrolennials, right. Yes, Afrolennials, right. okay. <laughs> now, you talk about technology and Afrolennials, which I presume is the younger people from teenage to young adult. Can you tell us about this and why you see them as the key to Africa? Yes. So, I mean, in my journey, because as I said to you before I actually ventured back to Africa, I always had this notion that anything used out in the West is probably going to take another 20 years before it gets to the continent. But I think you hear a lot of people talk about the leapfrog advantage. So when you start in from nothing and then you sort of just take a leap of faith and then basically just get from zero to a hero. So a good example is in Nigeria. I mean, back in, I think it was 2001 when the government decided to privatize the telecoms industry. Guess what? You had this South African telecoms company come in. They had a goal of actually getting their return on investment in five years. They made their returns in 18 months. And what helped them was they were coming to a sort of virgin territory. So when you talk about telecoms, of course, with Africa, it's few and far between. Only the middle class and the upper middle class have a phone at home. Now, what this telecom operator did was, okay, we're going to just come here, set up a satellite, and then provide people with sort of uh, telecoms connectivity through the use of mobile phones. And within 18 months, they were able to not only claw back their capital, but made about 80 to 90% profit. So when I say Afrolineals, I mean, these are the young guys, the young ladies who now use apples and samsungs i mean all across africa it's like it's just a, it's just a tech city and what has helped is okay with the likes of uh, mark zuckerberg coming down to nigeria last year i think it's starting to wake up the world of technology that hey here's a continent with 300 million smart young ones that we could actually educate and um, train in the technology world to make Africa a great nation. So that was why we decided to con that word Afrolineals. I love it. And there's another word that has been coined. Let's see if I get this right. Afrocapitalism. 
Yes. And why is this a unique word to Africa? And how could we use that to our benefit for us entrepreneurs? Okay, good question. So Afrocapitalism is just the philosophy that you know, the government is not there to do things for us. We need to tap into the private sector. So we have the likes of the richest black, not only in Africa, but in the world, the richest black man in Nigeria, Ali Kodangote, who's one of the Afri- Afro-capitalists, who says, look, for every cent that he makes on the continent, it will claw it back because there's no point for him taking his money out of Africa because here's a population of almost 1.2 billion on the continent. So Afro-capitalism is that philosophy that the private sector is there to transform the continent. When we talk about long-term investments, yes, you're going to have the foreign direct investment, but the word, the good old saying, charity begins from home, has to resonate with Africa. And this is where the big you know, entrepreneurs, like, the, like I said, the richest man in Africa, you've got another guy who once used to run and manage one of the biggest banks in Nigeria, Tony Illumilu. These are guys who are actually coming together and say, look, we have to do things for Africa. So that's the key word, and that's the definition of that word, Afrocapitalism, that we've actually coined in our book. Thank you for explaining that. And you've brought in the FDI, the Foreign Direct Investment Now, there is to some degree, and you've been on the ground, you've seen it more, you've studied it more, I'll let you describe it, but there's been this activity that we call kleptocracy, which is where various rulers, they'll use their position to take all the resources that they can. We've seen this for decades, actually, in Africa. How can foreign investors feel more comfortable, let's say, investing in Africa and knowing that they're going to be able to enjoy the increase in their investment and not have it just taken away and so forth. I'll let you just take that from there. Right, okay. So, yes, I mean, that's, that's, that's very good that you mentioned kleptocracy, and I think it's been the elephant in the room when it comes to Africa. But I'm glad to say over the last year, we've seen this, this sort of kleptocratic government slowly dying. I mean, a good case in point is in South Africa when the ex-president was actually voted out of power. Same thing happened in um, Zimbabwe. So basically, what's kind of unfolding right now is Generation Y, the young ones are saying, look, we've had enough of the old God. It's time to change. And I think what is actually playing a key role in this is also technology. So if you remember, I talked about the Arab Spring in 2011. That was able to unfold through the power of social media. So now there's no hiding place for kleptocratic governments. This is the Tony D'Urso Show. Just ahead, the chat continues with visionaries Mark Byron and Laura Jennings. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. Change starts here. Change starts now. Join us, the Voice America Influencers Channel. After months of strategizing and prepping budgets and looking at how we're going to position ourselves in the market, I didn't have anyone to fall back on. And I remember pulling the lever for all those campaigns, biting my nails, and just staring at the computer pretty much the entire day. This was the moment where, okay, we hired this guy to do exactly what he's saying. Now it's up to him to deliver. Trying to figure out the best way to serve ads to our customers. To me, it was a black box. AdRoll came in and said, we should target these users at this cadence, this frequency. We doubled our revenue based on what we were projecting for November, December. Succeeding after I've put myself on the line like that, it does give me confidence. To find out how T Public and 37,000 other brands grow their businesses with AdRoll, visit adroll.com slash RCR. That's A-D-R-O-L-L dot com slash R-C-R. 
Are you ready for provocative discussions with some of today's most powerful movers and shakers? Tune in to The Art of Significance, featuring Dan Clark, the modern-day Napoleon Hill, who interviews the wealthiest, most successful celebrities and business leaders on the planet who are using their influence to change the world. From authors to entertainers, sports figures, educators to military leaders, Dan covers multiple topics. Tune in every Monday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, on the Voice America Influencers Channel. The future of online TV is here. View exclusive content from your favorite talk radio hosts and new programs that you can't see anywhere else. Visit voiceamerica.tv today. Hear the stories. Be motivated. Be inspired. Join us today. Voice America Influencers. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDurso.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back on The Tony D'Urso Show. Today's show is with visionaries Mark Byron and Laura Jennings. All right, back to the chat with our guests. Another good thing that we already have in Africa is the sort of the Moi Brahim Index of African Governance. So here is someone from Africa who's saying, okay, we're going to start to benchmark every government of every country in Africa. It's like, call it the Hall of Fame or the Hall of Shame. So those that will make it to the Hall of Fame, these are the countries that will now attract the foreign direct investments. Those are they in the all of shame basically is saying to the outside world, well, do not pay a visit here because the government is still corrupt. So I think kleptocracy is actually dying. And it's I mean, I will give it another probably two to three years and things will just sort of unravel. And I think also the West is actually starting to see this. Hence the reason why, you, as I said, you had the prime minister of the UK visiting Africa for the very first time. That was the very first time she was actually in Africa. And then you had the Chancellor of Germany. About a month or a bit ago, you had also Francis um, Macron visiting Africa. So you can see that there is a paradigm shift when it comes to foreign direct investment. And Africa is open for business. Got it. Thank you. Very interesting points here. It really makes a lot of sense. We hope you're right on the change. But then again, you're on the ground, you visited most of these countries or a good percentage of them, and you've got that point of view. Very good on that. And I know you wanted to mention one last thing about bricks, sticks, and no strings. We could touch upon that, but give this call to the entrepreneur, you know, aside from, hey, let's get this book. You know, I want these entrepreneurs in my audience to come away with ideas that they can utilize to do business in Africa that will help them in their vision, in their goals. So I'd like to just put that all together and make sure we give some good advice on that. I think the first thing any would-be entrepreneur wants to do before coming to Africa, and I think we've done good service of that in our book. So the last chapter gives a whole list of contacts in terms of where to go. I mean who to see, and how to set about, you know, getting yourself established as a company in Africa. So think of this book as a guide, as I said earlier on. So you have the list of contacts. Also, my website is there. My contacts are there for any would-be entrepreneur who would want to sort of arrange just an initial call to basically find out, okay, which are the best countries, which are the best sectors, And how do I go about setting up shop? So I would recommend any would-be investor, any would-be entrepreneur to get their hands on this book. And yes, I mean, don't rush to get to the last chapter to get the list of contacts, but just go through the book and make sure you sort of relish and snow, taking all the sort of uh, useful bits of information as we've sort of laid it out in the book. Soak it all up. Mark, where can we get this book? Can we get it on Amazon, any other place? It's actually on Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, the usual bookstores. 
But I mean, for anyone who wants the ebook version, you have to go on Amazon actually to get it. Sounds very good. And if anyone in the audience wants to get a hold of you, talk about anything, they can reach you at bartonhayman.com. I'll spell it B as in boy, B A R T O N H E Y M A N.com. Is that right? That's my website. And my email address, of course, is Mark. That's M A R K dot Byron, B Y R O N, at bartonhayman.com. Very good. And by the way, if someone goes to your website, is there a link there for them to go to not only read about you, but a link to go to Amazon and get the book? Yes. So anyone can actually click on it and then go through my website to Amazon to purchase either a hard copy or an ebook version. Well, very good. Mark, thank you so much for spending some time with us. I must admit, naively, I had no concept or idea really of doing business in Africa You've opened up my world to probably the biggest pile of gold I've ever conceived with all these countries and where they are and what they need. It really is and really does sound like, indeed, the world's hottest market. I love it. And I'm curious, why do you say in your book, Africa Arrives? I'm just curious if there was a particular reason that you used and chose that wording. Yeah, good question. Yes, actually, well, myself and my co-author actually brainstormed and we finally arrived at this. And I think for me, it was an epiphany because like I said, I spent a great deal of my adulthood in the West and going back to Africa was like, okay, the son of the soul has just come back. So I used that as a sort of a leverage to say Africa arrives, to say, okay, I'm now back in the continent And I've seen the good things happen here. And I think it's time to make the whole world know that the continent has actually arrived. And it's sort of final frontier as regards doing business. I love it. Mark, thank you so much for taking some time to spend with us and go over this. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Tony. And now we have Laura Jennings join us. Laura is the CEO of the modern gifting company, NAC. K-N-A-C-K. And prior to NAC, Laura was a venture capitalist with the international private equity firm Atlas Ventures. And she began her career at Microsoft, where she ran a number of core businesses, including the email division and MSN. Welcome to the show, Laura. Well, thank you, Tony. Laura, it is a pleasure and honor to have you. You've done so much, including being at Microsoft. So you're really on the inside of cutting edge on technology, on the future. I think that's great. And perhaps that's helped you with your business, which we're going to talk more about in just a moment. But first, I really like to know, how did you become so good at, well, gifting and turning everything into a profit? How did this all start for you? Well, the real core idea behind NAC was celebrating the consumer as a creative force. So again, going back to my Microsoft days, I've really been watching the evolution of the internet and e-commerce on the internet for a couple of decades. And so that's really this idea of putting the customer front and center in everything you do in terms of e-commerce is really the core. The spark that led directly to NACShops.com, which I'm doing now, was actually when I was living in Barcelona. There was a really fun little kiosk-based candy company that was called Happy Pills. And they had a fun concept, which was candy as medicine. So they delivered candy in little pill bottles with funny sayings on them. But while I was watching that company, it really seemed to me that although it was a great concept, it would be even more powerful if they harnessed the creative potential of their customer base. So as far as gifting, I've always been a creative gifter myself. So I pick up things on trips. I don't shop all at the end of the year. I'm always looking for something that has a story. You know, most of us can recall a time when we gave someone a gift we were so excited about, we couldn't wait for them to open it. And what I know about that experience is there's a story behind it that made it perfect for you, your, the giver, and the gift recipient. Maybe it was an inside joke. Maybe it related to something the two of you had done together. But what made that gift great was that it was personal to the two of you. There was a story, and it wasn't about how much you spent. And great gifts really do have stories. And 
that's really how I came to put this concept of putting the customer front and center into the gifting experience. Gifting should be joyful. It's an incredibly altruistic act. And yet we often talk about it as a chore. And that's too bad. So that was really the core spark behind NAC. I'm very impressed by that. And while you're talking, I'm thinking of all the times I've given gifts, times people have given me gifts, what stands out, what doesn't. It's very interesting when it's very personal. And perhaps away from that model is the holidays where due to time constraints, After a while, I would just give out money or gift cards to family members, to the kids. And I would think about that sometimes going, they could buy more what they want. They could get what they want because they have a gift card and because I don't necessarily know what everyone has in mind that they want. But it became more impersonal. I was observing this from like the outside watching this whole endeavor. Even though they could get what they want, the memory is not there of the association What I mean by that is when I get a gift from someone, and I'm not asking for gifts from anyone, please, every time I use that object, like I got a great cup from someone in the shape of a guitar when they were in New Orleans, and every time I use that cup, I just instinctively think of them just because they gave me this great cup. So it's very interesting when you talk about the personal nature that creates that association. And is that why you got into gifting as a business? Other than it's a really great yeah. idea. It makes a lot of people happy. <laughs> this is the Tony D'Urso Show. Just ahead, the chat continues with Laura Jennings. But first, it's time for us to take a short break. See you back here in just a moment. This is the Voice America Influencers Channel. Be inspired. You heard that a majority of businesses fail. Don't be a statistic. Get my book free, The Vision Map. Beat the odds for your business success. Get it free at TonyDURSO.com slash vision. And set up your own successful vision map. Tony. D-U-R-S-O dot com slash vision. Do you believe that being fit is difficult? Do you think it requires turning in your favorite comfort foods for boring chicken and broccoli and spending hours in a gym? It doesn't. Tune into Have It All with Devin Alexander. Devin and her guest experts will show you how you can have it all at any age, from relationships to money to thinking bigger than you've ever imagined. Devin will fast track your goals to yummy reality. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time and 12 noon Eastern Time on the Voice America Influencers Channel. Have you had a chance to check out Voice America's online magazine and blog, Press Pass? If you love our hosts and shows, check out articles that give an even deeper perspective. Plus, topics about health and fitness, movie reviews, philosophy, business tips and tactics, spirituality, positive thought, current events, and even more about your favorite host. It's just a click away at VAPressPass.com. That's VAPressPass.com. VA Press Pass by Voice America. All access, all the time. We don't follow, we lead. Join us, the Voice America Influencers Channel. You're listening to The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. We'd love to hear from you via email. Be sure to send questions and comments to Tony at TonyDURSO.com. Now, back to The Spotlight. All right, we're back on The Tony D'Urso Show. This segment of today's show is with Laura Jennings. After a career in technology and venture capital, Laura says she founded NAC in 2015, and convinced that the future of e-commerce resided in putting the customer front and center. Take it or leave it retailers would be pushed aside by, tell me how you like it please, disruptors who harness technology to deliver exactly what the customer wants every time. And now back to the chat with Laura. Well, you know, you're, but you're exactly right. That example is exactly right. You know, when you're, even in the holidays, you're trying to do two things, right? You want the, the recipient to like what they get. So your point about giving them money or giving them a gift card 
does accomplish that. But what it doesn't do is that second piece that you recognized, which is it doesn't connect the two of you together in some kind of persistent way. You know, it doesn't strengthen that connection. You know, if we take the simplest act, you invite me over to your house and I show up with a bottle of wine. That's really nice. But if I show up with a bottle of wine and I give you that bottle of wine and I say, my husband and I drank this same wine on our honeymoon and we were so excited to find it and I wanted you to have it. Or this bottle of wine is made by et cetera, et cetera. It's the same gift, but it's a different feeling that we both have about it in terms of building connection. It has a story. That's right. And if you think about the leaders in the gifting space, particularly on the business side, Most of the go-to send-a-gift players in the market right now were, oh, all the leaders were formed in the previous century. One of the market leaders is 100 years old. And what's happening is we've got this demographic tsunami of millennials who are not only now the largest demographic group in the workforce, but increasingly they're the decision maker. And this is an audience of people who have grown up with technology. They are used to having things their own way. And more importantly, they understand the value of personal and professional brands, right? They've been curating their social presence their whole lives. And so solutions that aren't tech enabled, that don't reinforce their values, you know, if you're a millennial, you really want to, you believe that your purchasing power can represent your values. Who you buy from, who you do commerce with matters. And so that's the oppor- the business opportunity, is that this is an enormous market with a demographic disruption going on and a set of competitors who were the right solution for previous generations, but don't have the technical savvy, the kind of focus on every gift being made to order that the current generation of decision makers really has come to expect. I see. Another point on this, Laura, that I've noticed with gifts, especially gifts that I've received, they're not anything that I would have ever thought of buying. But once you get to use it, you find that you begin to like it for whatever reason. I'll give you a case in point. I got for my birthday earlier this year, one of these little UFO looking helicopter things. I would have never bought Uh that ever in my life, but we got it as a present. We appreciate it. So we went out into our big parking lot area with our dog and we started playing with it. And it was so much fun that we then made videos. We shared them with others all on something that I would have never bought. So there's another layer on this, even though you don't think that person may want that gift. If you think it's got some utility you'd be very surprised at how much they would appreciate something like that because they would never buy it. Right. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you another story somewhat like that. We had a a major bank buy gifts for 50 CEOs who had just made a list of very important people in a major city. And you would expect that gift to be something pretty traditional because these are CEOs and this is a business gift and it should be serious. But what they actually put together was a hammock and a can of wine and some peanuts. And it was a gift that the CEOs who got it really remembered and loved and thought was great because it was unexpected. It was something they were going to use. It's not something that typically would be thought of as an executive gift, but it had personality. And it's one of those gifts that is, is memorable. So agree. And by the way, we have a very strong audience here of entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, small business owners, as well as corporate level executives. How can they take advantage of this and use it to grow their business? So there's a couple of parts to this question. So let's see how, how can they get the right gifts, buy the right gifts. A person's halfway around the world, halfway around the country. How do you even know what to get them? Can you kind of help us? drill down this? Yeah. So we conducted a set of research studies around what recipients of business gifts think, particularly as you get into the fourth quarter. There's a lot of research around what corporations are planning to give, but there really was a dearth of research on what people who received business gifts thought. So that's a starting point. We now have data 
that you can down you can download the report from our website that can tell you what to give by area of the country, what other people are giving, what to stay away from, et cetera. So having that data is a starting point. The second is that you really want to give a gift that reinforces your values and perhaps the values of the person you're giving it to. And so this concept of merchant transparency, understanding who, what the values are of the products you're giving is a big piece of that. So for example, if we have a corporate customer come to us and they're a family-led business and that's really important to them, we'll make sure to find products that reinforce that value. We have a major foundation who uses us for business gifting and they really care about empowering female-led businesses and supporting sustainable product development. And so we pair them with merchants who support those values. So that's the second piece is to think about what are you trying to accomplish and what are your values? What do you want this gift to say? Because that's what will be remembered over the long run. And then finally, what we do here is we provide account specialist service. So you're not on your own. Our corporate customers have a dedicated account specialist in-house who understands what they're trying to accomplish, understands their value, understands the history of what they've given in the past. So by the time Labor Day this year rolls around, we'll already have some ideas percolating for what our clients might want to do this year. I like that. Great. And that research is available at NAC. That's K-N-A-C-K, NACShops.com? That's correct. Yes, you can download it there. Great. And, you know, we talk a lot about client giving in when we talk about business giving. But right now, really, employee retention, this is a hot labor market. And particularly in areas like technology, digital marketing, retaining those employees you've worked so hard to find is really important. And so we see just as much interest in gifting for employee retention as we do in traditional client gifting these days. Very good point. And if I may, something I've learned more just in this interview I'd like to share back with you. You've told it, now I'm going to tell it back is on that gift that has a story, such as a bottle of wine. While we were talking, I thought back on when I've received a bottle of wine as a gift, and a bottle of wine, ladies and gentlemen, lasts one night. That's it. It's gone. It's just poof, one bottle. And when there's a story with it, it has a whole different engagement with you. It means something different where... It adds now to, as a dimension, another dimension, it adds to that experience where you now talk about the wine, that the other person had that story. It it just gives more back. And I'm looking back at when I've received wine with the story or without, it is a big difference. I never thought of it. So the takeaway on this is to our entrepreneurs out there, if you're going to give a gift and you're not quite sure what to give, and you've looked at this research from Laura, which I'm going to look at as well. If you just have a story, even if it's something that you think is mundane, but if it's something you've used and like and enjoy, and you give that story with it, it brings and adds a whole nother experience to that gift. You are exactly right. And that last piece you said about if it was something you enjoyed, that is actually really powerful. And the research shows this, that particularly if the gift is coming from a CEO to employees or to clients. Saying that you are sharing with someone else something that's important to you is really flattering. And so that goes a long way into making a gift memorable. But the other thing is what we see businesses do a lot around the holidays is give gifts of food because that's the time of year where one office might be sending gifts to another office and you want things that people can share. And the data shows that if you add something that's permanent to that gift of food. Maybe you add a serving platter or you add a game or you add a tea towel, um, a wine opener with the bottle of wine. When you add those things to a gift that's otherwise consumable, the memorability of that gift goes up by about 50%, just that small act. And then there's something there that reminds them of your gift long after the food or the wine has been consumed. So true, so true. Many, many years ago, I learned in sales that if you give a small gift to the secretary or whoever is the gatekeeper for the executive you're speaking with 
or wishing to speak with, give them a plant or something that will stay there on their table, stay there on their desk, and it becomes permanent. It becomes something that they're always thinking of you somehow, some way. You're always in their mind. Well, Tony, it sounds like you have a natural knack for gifting, really. Well, Laura, I think it's my Italian, my Italian nature. We love to give <laughs> things. And I think between my wife and I, we're heavy on that side of giving things. It just seems to be the way to do it. Maybe it's old world. Maybe it's a European culture that's taken over in the U.S. I'm not quite sure, but it just feels good when you give something that has a meaning and importance. And I really like that point that you made on giving food. I've noticed when food is given, it's consumed right away and it's out of sight, out of mind. And it just doesn't add anything to the experience, though. I'm not saying don't give food. Food is great. And there's times at a birthday or a special occasion you can give foods. And I like your idea where you say give something else in addition to that. Laura, what would you say is the smartest decision that you ever made or impacted the business world and especially your gifting business? Well, I think that the trickiest part of an early stage company is being able to read the room and respond to what's happening while holding on to what's true and core to the company. So in other words, how do you become responsive to customer needs without losing what is uniquely yours? What is your reason for existing? And I think, especially in categories like my own, it's tempting in a market where there are a number of challengers attempting to disrupt the incumbents to look over at the other guys and think, well, they must have the answer. So for us, What is unique and true about us is that we give the customer exactly what they want every time. Everything we do is made to order, and we use technology to make that both possible and profitable. But it's a more complicated technology, business, and fulfillment model, even though it's core to what we do. So other than holding true to that vision, however, we've needed to respond to what actually happened once we launched the marketplace. You know, when we started the company, we really thought our business would be primarily consumer. And yet what has happened is that we're 70% corporate, and that has impacted our technology roadmap and our marketing efforts significantly. You know, on the marketing side, it's thankfully much more cost-effective to be closing orders 100 units at a time versus one to two. And if we had refused to, to pivot, if we had said, nope, our idea was that this was going to be mostly consumer, we would have missed the opportunity to reduce our marketing costs. And now that we have focused on that core customer being the business customer, we can more effectively plan our product assortment and our technology roadmap. They call it a pivot because you keep one foot firmly planted in your value proposition and then you pick your head up and look for opportunities in the field of play. And so I think being able to do that not lose sight of what we were doing, even though it was more complicated, but be flexible and respond to who in the market was really valuing our value proposition. That was probably the best decision. Amazing. Very good point on that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And last but not least, what great advice would you give for those, especially those starting out and really trying to grow their business? How would you see them using this gifting proposition and service? to help actually grow their business? Well, I think first, the piece of advice I would give to someone who is really starting a business is to think through their go-to-market strategy before launch. And that seems obvious, but even back in my VC days, it is a, it's a very common mistake that entrepreneurs make. For example, we have entrepreneurs with great products who are frequently coming to us looking for distribution. But because they originally thought they would have a direct-to-consumer model, they didn't build in the margins they need to now effectively compete in a wholesale environment. So when I was a VC, I would say the most common mistake I saw was hitting the accelerator before you really understood what your go-to-market business model was. And so that would be my first piece of advice. As far as gifting, one of the things you need when you are building a business is you need lots of eyes on the business. You have to have an attitude that says, good ideas can come out of almost anywhere. And so you can use gifting specifically to help build those business connections that support and help you grow your business. So think about it as a way to get more people 
with a little bit of skin in the game in your success. Very good points. Very good advice. And we thank you so much. And one last one here, Laura. I like to talk about purpose. I always like to know what's the personal motivation and drive. What makes you do what you do? To me, having been around in technology at the real beginning of the internet as an e-commerce vehicle, that this idea that I can, in some small way, help advance the technology and advance the way we think about solving consumer needs online is really fascinating to me. Very good points. Excellent. Well, Laura, I want to thank you one more time for sharing this wisdom and advice on how to turn gifts into memories and profits. Very, very appreciate everything that you shared. Thank you so much. Tony, thank you for talking with me today. Sure. And once again, Laura Jennings, her website is knackshops.com. Knack is K-N-A-C-K, shops.com. Thank you again. It was great. And for my amazing audience, thanks so much for listening. Remember, success awaits those who persevere and remain steadfast despite the odds. Be righteous. Join me on the next episode of The Tony D'Urso Show. We hope you've enjoyed this week's edition of The Spotlight with Tony D'Urso. Be sure to tune in again next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Influencers Channel. Now, enjoy the weekend.